I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president of the National Constitution Center, and I'm sitting here with Neil Katyal, former acting Solicitor General of the United States. We're here to talk about the Supreme Court privacy and technology. We have just one last case to discuss. It hasn't yet come before the Supreme Court, but Justice Antonin Scalia says that he thinks it will, and that has to do with the constitutionality of NSA surveillance. The lower courts are divided about this. Judge Richard Leon uh, in Washington, D.C. has struck down NSA surveillance of our so-called telephone metadata, that is the telephone numbers that we dial, as a violation of the Fourth Amendment. What is, what is his argument? Well, Judge Leon is right now in the kind of minority. I think there have been 16 different judges that have ruled on this, and every case has gone the other way. But Judge Leon has written an opinion that says that when the government collects telephone metadata, that it's not the content of the information, but rather the numbers that someone is calling, that that violates the Constitution. And the government has responded by saying, nope, it's not the content, it's just the numbers. And those numbers have been voluntarily turned over effectively to your telephone company every time you dial it. And so you've lost your expectation of privacy because you've picked up the phone knowing that the phone company knows exactly who you're calling. And once you've lost that expectation of privacy, the government and most of these courts have said, that's it, that's game over, you don't have the privacy right. Again, you know, they say maybe there should be a policy limits on this, political limits or something like that, but it's not something that the Constitution governs. We already discussed that case, Smith versus Maryland. Is that the central case and is the government relying on this idea that on uh, Smith versus Maryland to say you have no expectation of privacy in your phone numbers? I believe that the government is relying on that kind of concept of Smith versus Maryland. They have other arguments too, including of course the fact that Congress has authorized this program and the like and has done so in the context of not simple law enforcement, but rather national security information, information that the government has said can be vital to solving terrorist crimes. And they point to, for example, the fact that one of the 9-11 hijackers was living in San Diego and the government was hamstrung in getting information about that person without this telephone metadata program. The counter argument, of course, is that the White House Commission, the bipartisan commission set up to investigate the program, found that the surveillance had not stopped a single terrorist attack. This is a good note to close. The Supreme Court, of course, might reconsider Smith versus Maryland. Justice Sotomayor has said that it should, and in the cell phone case, all nine justices refused to apply Smith to a, a cell phone search. Obviously, we can't predict what the court will do, but how, what sort of thought process will the court go through as the various justices attempt to translate the Fourth Amendment into a digital age as they consider a case like NSA surveillance? Yeah, so I think the court, as we started, it does take a more kind of uh, wait and see attitude, a go it slow attitude, because they're worried about what they don't know. When you think about NSA surveillance, you've got two unknowns. You've got the technological unknowns, the complexities of the telephone metadata program, which are really intricate and hard. But you also have the threat of terrorism and how likely it is and what's likely to stop it. And the court's going to be uncomfortable of both of those realms. And so that's why I think it's going to take a while for the U.S. Supreme Court to rule on this issue, and certainly a long while before they rule definitively. I think the court feels that a lot of these things are best handled through political oversight and political debate, and indeed conversations, Jeff, like the one you and I are having, that can educate the people and can try and uh, change policy, not through the kind of sometimes heavy-handed mechanism of the courts, but rather through the more supple, dynamic legislative process. Well, Neil, it's been a wonderful constitutional conversation. Thank you so much for joining me on behalf of the National Constitution Center and the Aspen Institute. I'm Jeffrey Rosen.